Hallelujah. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Somebody say praise the Lord. It's good to see you today. I thought I'd come down here and get right and whoop you up close. <laughs> he needs it or she needs it? That means he needs it, right? <laughs> All right. We've been talking about what for five weeks already. Now come on, there's a cheat sheet on the wall. <laughs> what have we been talking about for five weeks? How to really trust God, the essence of what does it mean to trust the Lord, the the object, you know, what is faith, basically is what we're asking the question. How many have been here for most five of them, close to five of them, all right? So you should really have this next part already settled in your mind. It should be something you have actively been believing God for and trusting the Lord for. And and we'll, we'll start like we've started every week. Fill in the blank. Remember that part? 
I am really trusting God to or for. Don't say everything. We're talking about being specific. All right? So now this is where it becomes interactive. Y'all know what interactive means? It means you get to talk. You're participating now. It's not performance oriented. All right? All too often we want to performance in church. And hey, this is, church is really participating. Amen? So what do you trust in the Lord for? I mean, what, what is it in my own life? I have a family member. And I can say this out loud. They're not here. You know, they're not part of the service. So, <laughs> But, you know, I have a big family, so you'd never guess who it is. Or, you know, Thanksgiving we get together, there's 40 or 50 of us, and that's 40 or 50 still missing, all right? But I'm really trusting God for one of those family members who's dealing with an addictive behavior. I'm trusting God to deliberate their lives, to set them free, to bring them to the place in their life where they can serve the Lord the way the Lord wants them to, to serve the Lord because this has been a crippling problem in their life. And I have some promises from the Lord that I'm believing God for. I mean, I've got a word that I'm, I'm believing God for their freedom, all right? And so this is something I take to the Lord every day and put before the Lord and thank him that he's moving, claim the promises again, tell him I, I'm believing, let him know that I, I'm ready to see the fruit and the fulfillment of what the faith is in my heart because I know he's doing it and I know he's working there. So let me ask you, what do you believe in God for? Gary's got a microphone. Don't be shy. It gives you an opportunity. <laughs> it gives you an opportunity. <laughs> to... 30 seconds. Uh, sure you don't. Come on, stand up, whoever it is. Just somebody raise your hand real quick. We'll go, we'll start. You just get it started, right? I'm believing God for. If I can get through this. I told you I need more 30 seconds. <laughs> Just 30 seconds worth crying, right? <laughs> Go ahead, brother. My dad, he's uh, 84 this year. He's got cancer. It's metastasized into his brain. He's getting a little on the loopy side. He called me the other day and asked if I knew where he was. And he said he moved the house to where we used to go hunting. And I have no idea where that is because we've hunted all over Texas. So I don't know where he <laughs> moved to. But my mom said he's doing that a lot lately. And my, I'm encouraging the kids to talk to him more. My, 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 my prayer is that in his last days, he will repair his legacy. He struggled with alcoholism his whole life. You know, it's always been family second, alcohol first yeah. growing up. And, uh, you know, he's got grandkids that, that uh, he needs to build his legacy for and, and become a strong Christian. I mean, he talks about how he's saved, but I want more from him. Amen. I want more for that my kids can say, I knew who my grandpa was and what he stood for. Amen. Praise the Lord. We'll be believing you with it, praying for you. That Amen. Someone else got a hand up there. Um, I am depending on the Lord and, and trusting the Lord to fill in the gap uh, after the passing of my husband. And uh, I know he's true. He's good he's fa and faithful. And um, he's been doing his part since before the passing of, of, of Doug. And uh, so that's what I'm trusting God for. Amen. I believe we've got back here. here or... Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe God for salvation for my children. Yes. Since 15 years today that my husband he left us, and I thank God today because my children, they are believers. Amen. Some is there now in pastor school. Uh, even though it's not easy to, uh, to them to live in Africa, but God is taking over. Amen. So I believe God for Amen. salvation for everything on, in our lives. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Back the back of my left, so I know Tammy over there. Salvation for my mother. She's 85 and I've been praying most of her life. Amen. Amen. As we share these, these are also prayer requests we're sharing at the same time. That uh, we all be lifting these needs up because we all can relate to these on some level. Amen. I have five young men in my life. One is my brother. I have two sons-in-laws, and I have two grandchildren 
who do not know the Lord. And I'm trusting, I'm believing, and I'm standing on the word of God. Amen. Praise God. Gary's getting his steps in today. Yeah, we're uh, trusting on the Lord to uh, let us uh, adopt Paisley without any hiccups or hitches. So we're hoping for a smooth process. Amen. Someone else, get it up high so we can see it. I'm going to pick you if you don't, Eric. <laughs> Two over here. This is what I'm trusting the Lord for. This is what's in my heart, my prayer life now. In specifics. This is what I'm trusting God for. He's already touched my body. Hallelujah. For, my, for complete healing for my son, Raymond. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I'm trusting God for salvation for most of my family and that God will repair the um, the fissures. Yeah. Um, okay. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Right there. I'm trusting the Lord for my children, um, that they will come back to the Lord. Uh, I truly believe that they have publicly made professions and um, that they would just, um, that, the, that the Lord would just draw them back into himself. And, yes, ma'am. Uh, so Amen. every chance I get a chance to plant a seed on a grandchild, maybe the Lord will use one of those to... Um, to bring them back closer. I do have a seven-year-old granddaughter who asked to come to Awana's, so that's a praise. And so uh, I'm just trusting the Lord for whichever one he would use. Thank you. Amen. How many believe God's a miracle God, amen? We can, we can believe God for these things. They're in the Father's will. Uh, I just wanted to uh, put full trust in God that he will guide me and teach me how to care for my mother of 97 years old and she's in her later stage. She's got early dementia, but uh, it's, it's, it's not the same mother I grew up with. So I'm trusting God will show me how to handle Amen. the new person that I'm trying to love and just take care of. Amen. With every one of these things that we talk about today, come over here, uh, Sherry Perry there. You know, I believe that God gives us promises that we can, from his word, that we should be embracing and claiming and believing. Amen. I'm trusting God for my healing. Yes. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me, just, let me just tell you, folks, you know, uh, when I'm praying for this particular need and other things that I'm trusting the Lord for, it goes back to everything we've been teaching here lately about the Word of God and the priority of the Word of God. That uh, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. You know, when I, when I pray for this particular individual, I, I, you know, I, I, I remind the Lord of his promises that he's given to us in his word about our, our, our family, you know, of salvation from there. I remind God that, again, Lord, I, I know that you're working there. And I, I affirm the fact that I know, even though I cannot see, I know he's working. Why? Because he made these promises to me and he's made these promises to us. And a lot of times we don't see with the physical eyes. We need to be seeing with our spiritual eyes. God said it, that settles. It's happening, all right? It may not be on my time schedule, but hey, it's going to happen because God made a promise. And therefore, if God made a promise, I'm going to believe him for the promise. You say, well, Brother Joe, it's all going the direction. Well, how are you going to live your life? Seriously, how are you going to live your life the way the rest of the world lives their life? The, the scriptures call it the natural and the, and the spiritual or the carnal and the spiritual, the flesh and the spirit. The Bible says we're no longer the flesh, all right? That's not our life anymore. We, we have a new spiritual life. Uh, Salim uh, Khalim, Khalil did a great job at our men's dinner the other night. And he was making a point about the fact that, that, uh, you know, that we're, we're new Christians, all right? We're, not no, we're no longer sinners by nature. We're the children of God by nature. And if we sin, we, 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 we don't relate to it like before. It's, it's, it's not you know, joy, pleasure, fun, tell everybody else what we did. Now we're sorry. We feel, we feel uncomfortable. We're convicted about our sins. We just don't retreat it. And so we want to come and get forgiveness of God, get our sins. Well, we do that by faith, all right? That is a faith action. We came to Christ by faith. But somehow I think people get, kick it into neutral in their spiritual life. 
And we live like, as Paul told the Corinthians, he said, you live like everybody else. If you live like mere men. Now, that's a big statement. What's he saying? If you're a Christian, you're not merely a person, a man, a woman like you used to be. You're not of the old order anymore. You're of a new order and a new life. You're a child of God. Your life is now a spiritual life. And it's lived by, by, the, by the word of God and by the power of the spirit of God operating in our life. It, it is now the, the faith life. But isn't it easy just to get up in the morning and, and let the things of that day dictate our life? Well, I don't feel good today, so I'm not going to be good today. I don't feel good today, so I'm not going to be nice today. I don't feel good today, so I'm just going to be negative. And we let all these things happen, happening around us. Well, you don't understand. You don't have to account to me. You have to account to the Lord, all right? You tell him, Lord, you know, I don't feel good, so I'm not going to praise you today. Now, I can live my life that way or I can approach my life from a purely spiritual point, which means what? I do believe what the Bible says. This is the day the Lord has made today. This is the day that I will rejoice and I will be glad in him. Now, that, that requires a different kind of living. That requires a different kind of attitude that I'm going to put on. Because a lot of it, folks, you know as well as I do, it's just, what am I going to believe? Am I going to believe in my mind what my flesh and the world dictate? Or am I going to believe what God's doing and saying? This is a supernatural book. That's why I encourage you to read, 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 read. That's why we're doing the reading through in, in, in a year. I mean, we're in Exodus right now. And you read the, the, acts, the actions in Exodus. They're all just supernatural things. They don't, they don't make any sense. And, you know, this book comes from God. It's the inspired, infallible, and errant word of God. I mean, think about that. This thing, it's ridiculous from a purely logical human perspective. It is ridiculous. No human being would ever sit down and write a book like this and expect anybody to believe it. <laughs> Why? It's a supernatural book. It's a supernatural book. And God gets into our life and makes us supernatural people. We're not, we're not the, the old creatures anymore. We're new creations and we have this new life and this new capacity to walk with God and fellowship with, with the Lord and embrace his presence in our life and enjoy his presence in our life. And, you know, and you've heard me say it a million times. If you don't know God, all right, then you're walking around completely inadequate for the worlds you live in, the challenges that are before you. You can muscle up all the energy and the strength, but it's a hard way to live your life. And I, again, I repeat it. You're, if you're without Jesus, you're just kind of like a hunk of warm meat walking around. That's the best you got going for you. You got life, but you don't have real life. You got, you got existence, but you don't have abundant living. You, you may experience some ups and some downs and highs and lows and, you know, approach your life with a purely logical uh, frame of mind and just kind of, I'll get through this. And I, I'm, listen, if you get honest about your reading of the Word of God, you do believe that this is a supernatural book and we've been called to live a supernatural life. And if we're ever going to get it, then we're going to have to approach it with a completely different attitude. And that is a supernatural attitude. Jesus didn't come, die on the cross, be raised from the dead, give us his Holy Spirit, give us this infallible word so that we could live like the rest of the world. We've been called to a completely different reality. The world approaches it from the rational. The logical, well, this makes sense. It's science. But the Christian approaches, it says, well, there is a higher institute of learning. There is a higher school. There is another life. And it's not based upon what I see, what I feel, what I hear, what I experience. It's based upon what is God saying. Paul wrote the Corinthians, he says, you, you guys, he said, you walk like mere men. Now that wasn't an applause, all right? That wasn't a, a compliment, when we walk as men, now I don't know what's going on here, but all of a sudden it just started to feel like I'm in a well. When we walk as p mere men and as just normal people, then we're certainly missing out on what God has already set in place for our lives. I do believe that the Bible tells us that God has a plan for each and every one of us. For me, for my life, the direction, for the course of my life. And I don't, I don't want to stand before God and just say, oh, okay, well, it didn't make any sense. Do you want to do that? Well, God, you know, I'd have done it, but that was stupid. Who are you calling stupid? If anybody's stupid, it's not God. Somebody ought to say amen or oh me. I mean, think about it. 
even as we're reading through the, the Bible in this, this year process, is, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, there are supernatural things that God is doing. He calls Moses, all right? Why in the world would you call Moses? He's a murderer. <laughs> He's a wanted criminal. God speaks to Moses supernaturally, gives him a word which he has to believe. He tells him he wants him to go deliver those multiple millions of Jews that are living in the, in the bondage of the Egyptians. Well, how am I going to do that? That's a good question to ask. Amen. You may be facing a situation. Don't be afraid to ask, how am I going to do that? Moses did, Gideon did, everybody else did. You know, you have not because you ask not. How am I going to? He said, what's in your hand, Moses? Y'all read the, listen to the story, read it in your chronological readings, right? Everybody's on target. Some of you are, some of you aren't. We'll go back and catch up. Because Moses had a rod in his hand. He said, what's that in? Throw it down. It's just a rod. Throw it down. I'm adding a little bit of sanctified imagination here. <laughs> Throw it down. And the rod becomes a snake. And God, you know, I'm sure, I don't know about how you do it with snakes. I'm not a big snake guy. I'm kind of backing up here. Is this a poisonous snake? What kind of snake are we dealing with here? And God says, I want you to pick it up. By the tail. Now, it could be logical to pick the snake up, but it's not logical to pick the snake up by the tail. I mean, if you pick a snake up, if you finally get to it, you probably get one of those little sticks, you know, that reaches down and catches him. Or if you have the courage to reach down and grab him, you're going to grab him right behind the head and in the neck, right? But God says, no, pick it up by the tail. The message was, hey, I'm in charge here. You're going to have to trust me to be the head <laughs> and to take care of the head. And he picks it up by the tail and he has a rod again in his hand. I think everything in our lives has to be thrown down before the Lord so God can get the snake out of it. Hallelujah. God has to get the serpent out of our, our lives and our hearts so we do it by casting ourselves before him. Okay, and say, let, let's give a little, de, de, little sanctified imagination here. You're alive. You're out in the wilderness. Here you see Moses coming. He's got a rod in his hand. He's walking towards Egypt. And you say, where are you going? Going to Egypt. Oh, that's a long way. Uh, what are you going to do when you get to Egypt? Oh, there's about three to four million Jews there. I'm going to, I'm going to lead them out of captivity. Yeah. Where's your army? Got no army. Where's your, where, 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 how do you think you're going to do that? I got this rod. <laughs> you got a rod. Good. You know, what are you going to do with that rod? And if you follow the story, in each situation, whether it was the plagues or the crossing of the Red Sea, he takes the rod and holds it up before God. It's a symbol of a committed and sacrificed life. I mean, really, this, this, that's not, I don't believe that's a fairy tale. A lot of people say, well, you know, that's just a fairy tale. And you know how, how stories can kind of, kind of grow over time and get mythological and full of myth. And, you know, it's not really factual. Uh, you know, the, the, what about the, the splitting of the Red Sea? Well, we know that there are areas of the Red Sea that are very shallow. And it was shallow there and they just walked across. Great. That explains it. How do you explain those thousands of Egyptians following them in chariots drowning in six inches of water? <laughs> it's not mythological. This is not just bedtime stories. These, I know, I know every one of you are sitting there going, uh -huh. but no, I want You got to get a little deeper in your spirit. This took God. This is supernatural. Your Christian life is a supernatural life. You can't continue to live it like a carnal person or you're going to be miserable. Miserable. This is not, a, it's not a normal book. It's a supernatural book. It can't be lived by, 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 by logical means and, and, and just purely in the, in the energy of your own strength. It won't work. Look at Gideon. Gideon, what are you going to do? Gideon's been called to deliver the children of Israel from the Amalekites. And they're, they're, in the, they're without number, hundreds of thousands most likely have invaded the land. And God says, Gideon, I want to raise up an army. So Gideon gets to work and raises up a 10,000 man army. He's probably thinking, Lord, where are the rest of them? And the Lord says, you've got too many. Now, why in the world would you tell me I have too many? We're outnumbered already. Basically, I don't want you to get it in your head that you're living and winning this victory by your own merit, your own talent, your own abilities, or your ingenuity. It's going to be obvious when this deal is done and you get down to 300 men, this is going to be done by the power of God. Can't you imagine meeting Gideon heading for the battlefield with this little band of 300 men? Hey, Gideon, where are you going? I'm going to go get rid of the Amalekites. We're going to kick their behinds. 
They have been invading and ripping us off far too long. We're done with it. God's done with it. We're taking over. How many men you got? 300. What are you going to use? Well, we have these lanterns. We got these candles we're going to put in them. We got these horns we're going to blow. What an idiot. What an absolute idiot. How stupid is that? In the logical, and isn't that the way we think logically? How dumb is that? Now, I know you've been sanctified long and everything. Oh, that was marvelous. That's ridiculous. It's crazy. And what does God do? He does it. Super. How does God get the children of Israel out of, uh, out of Egypt? He, he does it. How's God going to deal with that, that friend, that loved one, that parent, that situation? He does it. He's just a big God. And he'll do beyond what our expectations are if we'll hear what he wants to do, listen to what he's saying, and believe, hey, I've got to be supernatural in my approach to what is going on here. And Jesus is always pulling me, and I believe you, too, into impossible situations. Well, there's, 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 if God doesn't come through, I'm sunk. I'm, I'm seriously sunk if God doesn't come through. And that, and you say, well, I, we don't want to get there. That's where we should really be realizing that we're living because no matter what you've sunk your security into, it could be gone in a moment. Seriously. It could be gone in a moment. Well, I'm extremely talented. It could be gone in a moment. It wasn't yours to start with. God gave it to you. Well, I'm pretty secure. I've got a big bank. It could be gone in a moment. Has before, could again. Really, we've got to come back to the place that I am trusting God. I'm trusting God. I know what the world says. I know what logic dictates. But in this situation, I am just going to believe God. God, this goes even into the New Testament. The Lord was just pulling those disciples constantly into impossible situations. Feed the 5,000. Wow. Feed the 5,000. We don't have a catering service out here. Feed the 5,000. We don't have anything to feed them. And God always provided. If they would just listen and then follow the instruction, God gave them the answer. It is not any different for you, for me, for Peter, for Paul, or anybody else in the Christian life. We are all called to live on the same level of faith. What are you doing, God? What are you up to? What can I trust you for? Where am I believing you? What am I facing? What's my situation? What's my circumstance that seems like the impossible situation that I'm facing? How am I going to get around this? Well, you can sit down with your calculator. You can get your smartphone out, and you can get your little smart brain to work, but you're not going to figure it out on your own. You may come up with some lopsided, lame, band-aided way to get through it, but it's not what God wants if you're not trusting him. What are you trusting the Lord for? I mean, really getting a hold of God. I'm hanging on to the hem of his garment, and I ain't letting go. This is where I'm believing God. Again, this is a supernatural life. I mean, even in the simplest of things, God brings me to a place where if it's really going to happen the way he wants it, then it's going to take me to trust him. Let me give you a good one. Jesus says, don't worry. But yet we sit around and wring our hands, pull our hair out, moan and groan and complain because we're so wrapped up with a worry. We're just worrying about it. We're struggling over it. We're, we're not praying about it. We're not carrying it to the altar in faith. We're not holding on to heaven. We're not saying, God, what do you want from this situation? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to say? How do you want me to respond? We're just worrying. And you just can't stop worrying of your own self. Or you would have done it a long time ago. And Jesus said, hey, be at peace. Don't worry. Well, what if I'm being sued? Hey, give them, give them your coat and your cloak. What if they attack me? Turn your cheek. What if they curse me? Bless them. Hold on. That's too much. Love your enemies. You see, folks, we have trouble God, just trusting God in those few things I just mentioned. Because we want to hold on to our reasoning power. Well, they offended me and they hurt me and they did this and they said that and they went there and they, they, this happened. And, and so because, you know, we're just going to pull ourselves up and defend ourselves. You, you don't need to defend yourself. 
God's got your back and your front, top and bottom. Amen? He's got it all. But you've got yourself so twisted up. Where's the action? James said, show me your, your works. That'll show me your faith. If you want to see my faith, he said, look at the way I'm living my life. Look at what comes out of my mouth. Look at the attitudes of my heart. Then you'll see if I'm really trusting the Lord. And then you'll see if it's not just religious ritual, but it's the real thing for me. I mean, we look at this and honestly, we, we say to ourselves, well, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. And I'm glad it doesn't. Amen. If it did, everybody would do it. <laughs> The person who doesn't know Christ cannot comprehend this. They say it is some religious action that we do in regard to some, something we've been given this code book to live by. They don't realize this has everything to do with me fellowshipping with my Heavenly Father and me learning how to experience this supernatural life and me learning how to cooperate so that I'm literally participating in His very nature. And it starts pouring into me, and then it gets to pour out. Jesus said, you know, that, that uh, this is a life that, that's a supernatural life and it, it has to be lived in a supernatural way. And he, even he gave us the, 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 the clear pictures of how it should be lived. Paul, Peter wrote this to the church. How do I live the supernatural life? He said, God's power has given you everything, all things that pertain to your life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called you to glory and virtue. What's it say here? God has given. English present day language, has given. It's a past tense action. It's already been done. If you're a child of God, this is already taken care of. God has already given you everything that you need to live a godly life. God's given you everything so that you can be godly. God's given you everything just to live your life. That's already been given to you. It is the past tense. I mean, so in other words, if I have a need, God already has a supply and I can trust him for it. God has given, past tense, God has given everything that Joe Arms really needs to be successful. Now, I failed many times in this, all right? So I, I'm also preaching to myself as well because there are times when I react in the flesh instead of waiting for the Spirit of God to bring the righteous response that he wants to bring and spending a moment in fellowship with the Father before I do anything. I usually have a tendency, like you do, to consult my flesh before I consult the Spirit. Is this understandable? All right? If I can understand this, certainly I know you can, all right? Because I'm slow. I really am, all right? I, I didn't make the honor roll at school. Some of you are real smart. Maybe that's the problem. <laughs> Maybe you're too smart. Maybe you need to dumb it down a little bit and say, hey, I'm going to trust God. That's not definitely dumbing it down. That's wising it up. What's he saying? Well, how did I get what I needed for my life and to be a godly man? It came through the knowledge of Jesus. Knowledge of him who's called me to glory. I'm supposed to live in glory. I'm supposed to live in virtue. I have this righteous life that God's called me. The only way I can do it is not leaning on me or leaning on you or leaning on the pastor or whatever. I have to lean on Christ. I have to trust the Lord. It is the life of faith. How do I live it? Well, I just learned to trust, trust the Lord. What did Jesus say? And we've talked about this. So I'll just reference it. He said, the things that I say are the things the Father's spoken to me, so that's what I say. Man, how often could we wait to have God speak through us instead of speaking? Amen? Instead of just, 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 just speaking, waiting to be spoken through. What does God want to say in this moment? Can I, can I, can I, be, can I be quick to hear and slow to speak? The slow to speak means I'm, I'm going to... Jesus said, hey, in fact, what you see me do, he said, that's what the Father told me to do. In other words, every miracle Jesus did was just a, was an act of faith. He did what the Father said, and he did. Now, he had the power to do everything within his own capacity. He's still the Son of God. But he, he did not. In fact, he made it clear in multiple places, I'm just doing only according to what the Father said. In other words, I'm leaning on the Father. I'm doing what he says. I'm acting in regard to what he says. That's the life of faith. Jesus lived by faith. We've been called to live by faith. To trust the Lord and to hear what he says and do what he says. And, and when we do that, it, it, it's amazing. Now, how do we learn that? We learn that by experience and by spending time with God and getting in the word. If you're sick and tired of hearing me spend time with God and get in the word, then start spending time and getting in the word and getting with God. And by the way, I'm going to say it till I die. Because this is the way to live the supernatural life. 
You have to spend time with God. You have to get with God. You have to hear from God. You've got to be in the Word of God. It can't be a casual thing for you. My prayer throughout this whole chronological reading of Scripture is that you get into a fresh new habit of hearing from God as He speaks to you from His Word on a daily basis. Just as Jesus taught the disciples how to do this, he teaches us. He, he was always pulling them in those impossible situations. We're facing some situations in, in, in my life. You're facing situations in your life. We really need to hear from the Lord. We really need to take some time with God and believe that he's got what I need. He's promised it, everything according to my life, everything about godliness. He says he's giving it. It's all been given to us. I mean, when you gave your life to Christ, he gave you a new mind, the mind of Christ cleansed and gave you a new heart. You're a new creation in Christ. And it is a spiritual life. Christianity isn't following some nice ritualistic laws and rules and codes of ethics and morality. It's a commitment to Jesus. It's spending time with your Father who loves you dearly, who abandoned heaven with his sin to the earth for your sake, for my sake so that we can have this relationship with Abba Father. But we just ignore him all too often. I think the reason most people haven't really learned how to trust God, it comes down to one simple thing. We just lack the daring discipline to trust the Lord, the daring obedience. We know what God said. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But where's the step of action? God has said to treat this situation in this way, and if I'm not doing it, I'm not believing God. Simple. We just lack the commitment that, that's needed, the act of faith, the work of faith, as we've called it. Now, we got saved that way. If you are a Christian, this is what exactly you heard the word and you took the step of faith and you received the grace of God in your life. You just trusted God for his promise. How do you know you're saved? Well, I know I'm saved. I, such and such day, I gave my heart to Jesus. I asked him to come in my life. I confessed him as my Lord and Savior. I know I'm saved. How do you know you're saved? Because the Bible says so, Pastor. Everything in your life that God's got a word for, you just need to, you took the daring commitment of faith to give your life to Christ. Now start giving your daily life to Christ. This day, what is God doing today? I mean, what and who will be in front of you today where well, you need just to hear the Lord walk with God in that day. That becomes now an adventure. It becomes an adventure of faith. It becomes now you begin to see and actually witness and experience God on levels that many people will never do so. The Word of God. Applicable every situation. And God gives us these words, and now if my responsibility to trust and now obey. It's like, it's like God, that, 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 that action of obedience, that action of faith, you know, that's, that's like the avenue to freedom. That, that's the outlet where you experience God. Let me, let me just give you a real a simple illustration of this. All through Scripture, God's given us these words to, to respond to. And if we're not responding, if we're not doing what he said, then we're not experiencing God. Again, it's not some kind of ritualistic robot. No, God said this. I trust God. God's leading here. I trust God. God spoke to me about this. I trust God. Well, I failed. Well, God said this during your failure. Respond, repent, get up. Let's go move forward. Keep, let's keep going. We're not done. You know, you, you, the righteous man falls seven times. He gets back up. All right? I don't stay down. Well, I don't feel good. I feel so condemned. Get up. You're condemned because you're letting the enemy condemn you. You're condemned because, yeah, you did wrong. But, hey, God said, forgiven. You're my child. Live this way. Walk this way. Speak this way. Operate this way. And you will experience me in the fullest, realest sense that you could ever imagine. And one of the most simple clarifications of this, and I know some of you may roll your eyes when I give you this illustration, but it is so appropriate. You all ready for appropriate? Somebody say amen. amen. Give. And it will be given to you. Good measure. Press down. Shaken together. Running over. It will be put into your lap. In fact, with the measure that you give it out, it will be measured back to you. 
If you give a little, you'll get a little back. You give a lot, you get a lot back. How many of y'all know that verse? I want to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of you think that verse is a suggestion? It's not. It's not a suggestion. The Greek language is so cool. And it's interesting that God chose the Hebrew and the Greek language. They're so has such specificity to those languages. And if you if you if you would get out your your your, your Greek uh, dictionary and you'd look this word up in this particular passage, you'll see that this particular word, give, is a, is a command. It's called the present. This ver, it's a verb that is a present active imperative. Present needs to be done in the present. We're always in the present. It's to be actively done. And he's, it's, it's an imperative, which means it really isn't an optional thing. God says, if you give, no, he just said give. Give, and it will be given back to you. That's the way the literal language of this passage reads. Give. Give. So what's the Lord telling us? We should be givers. We give. And the interesting here says, and whatever you give, that's what I'll give back to you. In fact, if you, if you broke it down, it's a command, a promise, and a principle all in one verse. The commandment is just to give. You know, I think we're so, we're so hooked into this age of grace. We're under grace, and we don't have to do anything to please God. Where did that come from? We're in an age of grace and obedience. Just because we're under grace doesn't mean we obey the Lord. We, I, and I tell you, the majority of Christians have this mindset in the culture today. You know, uh, yeah, there, there are things that really, you know, I'm under grace, so I don't need to go to church, and I don't need to give, and I don't need to witness, and I don't need to do anything. All those things the Lord has an expectation of his children to do in the natural flow of their Christian life. We don't do because we're under grace. That is an erroneous, false doctrine. Yes, I came to God by grace. I couldn't save myself. His grace. He saved me. But he didn't save me until I made a choice. All right? And he won't bless me until I make the choice. And God says, here, here's an avenue. If you're really looking for an outlet, you want a way, you want a method, here, here's the outlet, here's the method, here's the way. He said, give. And by the way, if you do, it'll be given back to you. Press down, shaken together, running over. So it's a command. But at the same time, it is a promise. So in other words, if I do give... God promised me. God promised me. And he doesn't ever break a promise. And as much as I trust him for my salvation, I can trust him in this verse. As much as I trust him in my salvation, when God tells me to forgive, I can forgive. But you don't understand. No, no, no. I can forgive. I'm free. I'm under grace. <laughs> I have the ability now. The power of God is on my life. I'm participating in the divine life, the divine nature. Everything con concerning life, concerning godless, I can, I'm up to it, man. Come bring it on. Give. And he gives you this promise. In fact, he tells you how it will be given back to you. He says, hey, uh, you give and I'll give it, to, I'll give it back good measure. That means it'll be in, a, in an, advanta an advantage, all right? It'll be a blessing. It will be more than what you gave. In fact, that particular, we talk about the precision of this language. This is a word which means fitting, beautiful, and advantageous. You give, and what I give you back will be fitting, it'll be beautiful, and it'll be advantageous. Just what you need. Press down. It, it literally means to compact something. So God says, whatever you give, I'm going to give back to you. I'm going to give so much, we have to press it down so you can get it. Because if I just gave it all to you, we, we don't press it down first, it's, it's going to make a mess everywhere. So I'm going to compact it, and that's literally what I mean. You know, if you're, if you're responsible for taking the trash out in your house, you know what this means. Amen. Honey, is it time to take the trash out? No. <laughs> Compacting it. Tomorrow, maybe. <laughs> literally, that's what it means. It means you to literally press it down. God said, I'm going to give it to you back that way. I'll have to because that's the only way to be able to fit into to your, to your lap and into your pocket. He says, press down, shaken together. Agitate something so that it settles is what the word means. So it can, so you'd be able to handle it. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm going to shake it together, press it down, shake it together. In fact, he uses this word running over. 
All right? Now, that is a word which means to go outside the limits or outside the boundaries of something. And it is a word that's an abstract word, which literally means it has nothing to do with liquids or fluids, all right? But everything is material. And isn't that interesting that God would choose that particular word in the Greek language, the Holy Spirit would, to use this? So he's talking about, hey, you give of the material, and I will bless you back with the material, and I will bless you in such a way that it'll, bless, it'll freak you out. It'll freak you out. Now, that is one of the simplest promises, and I would probably say there's probably not anybody in this room, maybe one, who's not really familiar with that verse. But in all our familiarity with the verse, the question is, what kind of giver are we? Have we really stepped out in faith? He didn't say keep, he said give. And however you give, I'm going to bless you back. This is found throughout all the Old Testament and the New Testament. All right? Simple enough? Do what? Give. Do what? I know, some think that's a cuss word. It's four letters, but it's not a cuss word. Okay. Y'all remember Fonz on the... Fonzarelli on the TV show. There's certain things like he couldn't say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This way, some people treat the giving. It won't come out. <laughs> you know. Like Bill Stafford says, you know, we ought, when we baptize people, it, when they give this, get saved, we ought to baptize them with their wallet. <laughs> get them all in. Everything's committed to the Lord. Because this is such an issue. Why? Because the natural mind, the carnal mind, the reasoning mind says, don't give. Especially when we're in need. Right? Because when we're in need, we can't give. When we're in need, we can't afford to give. When we're in need, I've got a budget. You know, I've got my budget, and I've got to live by my budget. No, you need to live by what God says. God will get you a budget, right, and you should operate. But God's always going to make room in your budget for giving. Because that's the principle of supply and demand. That's the way that God gets it back to you. And he's not talking about in heaven. He's talking about now. There are verses that talk about laying treasures in heaven, but there's many more verses that talk about being a good steward of what God's given you, and the evidence of you being a really good steward is that you've learned how to give. And if you don't know how to give, you're a lousy steward. One amen. <laughs> there are some of you who have learned this principle, and you're walking in liberty today, and you're walking in freedom today, but there are others in the majority who just really haven't learned the simplicity of this and it gets down to this place, am I really willing as a Christian to live this life of faith to really hear what God is saying about every area of my life? And, and folks, this is every area of your life. It's, I'm not just talking about money. Some of you have no friends. And you tell others, I don't have any friends. I've had people call the church and say, I don't have any friends. Or no one welcomes me and no one greets. You've got it all backwards. You're supposed to be the friendly one. It's not getting here, it's giving here. In fact, Proverbs says that if you want to have friends, you must show yourself what? Friendly. But if you come in and you're wrapped up like a tight clam or oyster and the sweet pearl of Jesus is inside, but you ain't about to let it out, then don't expect to get any in. You're closed up too tight. You want to come to church be there, attend the church, do your religious thing, but you're not about to get involved in other people's lives. And I hate to tell you this, but Christianity is all about getting involved in other people's lives and being vulnerable. Well, I got hurt. You're going to get hurt. But you do it as under the Lord. And God says, if you get hurt, I'm really going to bless you. If you get persecuted for righteousness sake, that's going to even be a greater reward. So you've got nothing to lose. I need friends. Be friendly. No one ever encourages me, Pastor. Who are you encouraging? Who are you literally encouraging? Who have you shared with this week a really strong encouragement? Maybe you sent them a scripture verse. Maybe you spoke to them on the phone and you prayed with them. Maybe you gave them a, a word that God given you for them. You, I mean, you, they've been on your heart. You've been, you've been living a life. It's, it's not just all about you anymore. So do you understand the principle? Now, I'm not trying to pick on you, okay? Don't, don't misunderstand this. It's my responsibility to give you the good news as well as the bad news. Now, I don't get a lot of pats on the back for the bad. 
Amen? We like it when the sermon's been just mostly entertaining and sweet and some funny stories. We need to be faithful with each other. And my faithful responsibility is to encourage as well as reprove, the scripture says, is, a, is, a, is the pastor and the, is a man of God. But I want to encourage you in this, folks. This is, a, this is a whole lifestyle that God has for you of learning how to give in every regard of your life. If you need friends, be a friend. If you need encouragement, give encouragement. If you need fellowship, give fellowship. If your wife doesn't love you, love her more. If your husband doesn't love you, give him all. Love him more. You reap what you sow. You just keep investing. You keep giving and you keep investing because as you do that, then the rewards come back. I remember uh, being part of a, one of these multi-level marketing things years ago. But it was brilliant to, to hear this guy that spoke for, on behalf of the company. He was talking about, he had this principle called feeding the pipe. And it was, a, it was a business principle, but it was a biblical principle. What do you do about it? What's it mean feed the pipe? In other words, here's the pipe. This is where you get, and this is where you put. If you don't put anything in the pipe, nothing comes out the other end of the pipe. So what do we put in here? We put in mercy. We put in grace. We put in love. We put in gifts. We, put in, we, 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 we do what we expect. He said, but he said, it may take a while to get from the pipe through the pipe down to where it comes out and into your benefit, but you keep loading the pipe. Everybody in business knows that. There's times of, of sowing and there's times of, of reaping. Amen? But if you're not sowing, don't expect to reap. If you're not giving, don't expect the getting. I know some people, well, you just don't think you're very spiritual to expect the Lord. I had a guy tell me that one time. My wife was working as a secretary of a church, and I was in evangelism, and I remember going getting her for lunch, and the church treasurer was there, and I, he was telling me how things were horrible, and the needs weren't being met, and all this was going on. I said, hey, well, what do y'all give as a church? What, do y'all support mission? What do you mean give? We, we can't afford to give. And so I just basically shared the principle, you know, if you don't give, you don't get. And he said, well, I just think that's just wrong to expect God to do anything. How'd you get saved? Did you expect God to save you when you just trusted his word? Maybe that's your problem. Maybe you don't expect God to do anything. You don't expect God to do anything if you're not going to do anything. You're not going to do anything. But faith is an expectation. And God's the one who tells him to trust him and try him and believe him and see what he does in our midst. I would say today, whatever need you're facing, maybe it's a loved one that's lost. And you've been praying for God to send somebody to that loved one to speak to them. Who are you speaking to on behalf of somebody else that's praying that same prayer? Are you with me? Are you being faithful? A while ago I said, what's right in front of us? This afternoon, tomorrow morning, you got, things are going to be right in front of you. And you can approach it with two ways. You can approach it as supernatural or you can approach it as natural. If you approach it as supernatural, God's going to open your ears and your eyes to see some things you hadn't noticed before. Pick up on some things you hadn't picked up on before. To say some things you hadn't said before. To do some things you hadn't done before. Because you're going to be hearing the Lord speak to you. Will you be faithful to do just what's right in front of you tomorrow? Somebody's praying you will. Somebody's praying you will. You may be that person someone's been praying for. They may live up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, or California, or New York, and they've been praying for somebody down here in Texas. That may be the person you see at the store. It may be the person you work with. You may be the answer. They're just opening your mouth. Well, I don't know what to say. Jesus said, you don't have to worry about what to say. I mean, I said, don't you? he said that. You don't have to worry about what to say. My spirit is in you. And guess what he does? Boop. He loves the opportunity to speak through you. We've all had those experiences. I'd hope if we've been saved for any length of time, when you witnessed to somebody and you walked away from that experience, and said, wow, I didn't know that was in me. You know, well, that was pretty cool. I'm, I'm smarter than I thought. No, you're not. <laughs> but God is, and he's in you. He is. He knows what to say. I used to do a lot of street witnessing down in Market Square, my early days of ministry. They wouldn't let me preach anywhere, so I had to go down there and preach. And going down there to preach, you know, it was always those opportunities. There'd be situations going on all around you. So I don't say, there'd be a group of people, you knew they were gang members, but, but God tells you to go over and speak to them. I don't know what to say to these guys. But just go over. And they say, what do you want? And just start talking. God sent me over here. <laughs> that usually gets somebody's attention. God sent me over here. And just start talking. 
It's the same way in our life. Every day she takes me for me still. You know, I, I know a lot of the Bible, but I don't know what to say half the time when it comes to talking to people. But God always opens the door and leads the right way, gives you the word to say, and you see God move. If we do that, I can tell you, next Sunday and the Sundays to follow, the church begins to grow a little more, a little more, a little more, and a little more. Because we're giving God's blessing. But it takes more than preachers and singers. It takes all of us being what God's called us to be, the church. Can we be the church this week? Can we look for the hoes that are hurting, those that have a need? Can we just step out in faith and really trust the Lord in the days of our lives that are ahead of us still? I want you to stand with your heads bowed. And as you do, you know, I, I'm hoping the Lord really spoke a word of clarity to you. And that, you know, that you're just embrace that word. I'm going to ask you just, even now, if you'd like to, just come to the altar and just turn that over to the Lord. Maybe the Lord gave you, maybe something you even mentioned and in, in, in what you're praying for and you're praying. Maybe just bring that up again to the Lord and just claim the promises of God that he's told you. Just come back to the altar today and say, Lord, I want to put this person on the altar before you again today. It's dad, mom, relatives, whoever. Just come pray for him once again. Let's just have a, a ministry time here. As the band begins to worship and to sing, and why don't you just step out and even now begin to bring this to the Lord and to the altar. If you're here without Jesus, God's spoken a word to you. It needs to be believed. Today, I'm going to ask you to come and pray with any of us that are here in the altar, all right, and say, I want to give my life to Christ today. Let us rejoice with you. You've made a step of faith that's going to change you for the rest of your life. And just as God was going to give you the power to do what you need to do now, he's going to give you the power for each day if you trust him for it. It's a past tense action. He's already given it to us. We just need to act on it. Maybe it's a situation that's just been struggling. Come, just turn it over to the Lord. Just leave it there at the altar and say, God, again, I thank you. God, again, I trust you. God, again, I believe in you. But whatever the Lord is saying to you, we can pray with someone or pray with yourself or bring someone to the altar. Feel free. We want to take this time as a miracle moment in our lives and really let God do what he desires to do. Maybe it's just the point of saying, Lord, I've, I've been missing you. I haven't been an obedient child. I, I've been an unbeliever as a believer. You know, I hadn't really been trusting you. Put that before the Lord today. Claim the promise of 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, God's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a great promise to claim. It's claimed often by myself. But whatever the Lord's saying to you, would you come? We'll be ready to pray with you, receive whatever the Lord's telling you. Maybe you're looking for a church home. You want to be a part of what God's doing here? Come, share that with someone today.
Just bow your head with me for a moment. Just the music continues. The Spirit of God has such a very special and unique way of dealing with us. He just gently comes and speaks to our spirit, to our heart. And more than even hearing it in our head, we hear it in our heart. I pray that you'd have a heart to receive today what the Lord has said to you. That you'd have a tender heart, you'd have an open heart, you'd have a ready heart to receive whatever he spoke to you. Hopefully it was a confirmation and an encouragement to continue to hold on to what God's told you to, not to let go. You need to listen to that. The Bible says in due season we will reap if we faint not. Let's hold on to our Father. Let's trust Him. He is so present. Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, I thank you for the precious truth of your Word which gives us clarity, which gives us guidance, which gives us, Lord, an understanding that the world can't give us. And Lord, I am glad that it's a supernatural book and it doesn't make sense to the world. But we have to be part of the family to, to comprehend it because it's your family. And that's your desire that each and every one of us be a part of that family. Draw us to yourself. Continue to give us ears to hear. Convict us when we try to resist or turn you away. Draw us to yourself. Thank you that you love us, that you care for us, and you guide us. In Jesus' precious name, everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated. Amen, amen. Let's do this again next week. <laughs> Amen. It's fun day. Everybody ought to be in church on fun day. It's, it's, it's the will of God that we should gather together and not forsake the assemblies of ourselves together. That's Bible. That's not pastor, all right? The pastor likes to talk Bible. Anyway, praise God in the Lamb. I am trusting that you're trusting for whatever it is that the Lord has for you and is drawing you to and has for you to do. We have a few announcements, all right? So Brother Gary's going to come, and we'll be dismissed after that. Amen. When you came in, you received a bulletin. Please check your bulletin. Facebook page or any of our social media for uh, details about our church or events that are coming up as well. Um, to everyone from all the staff, team, students going to Belize in, in March, uh, they just want to say thank you. Uh, thank you for just your generosity because without the church's generosity and, and, and you understanding the call God has given us as Christians to love God, love people, and reach the world, we could not do the things that we could as a church. And and because of that, you know, I, I think at last count, I want to say that almost all of our youth are paid for uh, because of your generosity. So thank you so much. Uh, we'll have an updated numbers, but I'm, I'm almost sure that all of them are paid for. Um, welcome card for the first time visitors. Uh, please bring your welcome card to the uh, reception out in the front. And our pastor would love the opportunity to meet you, greet you, put a free gift in your hand. And we'll also have some lift leaders there as well to talk to you about lift. That's our small group, our cell group ministry. Um, don't forget your tithes and offerings at Believers Fellowship. We don't pass a plate. There are offering receptacles in the back. And just give unto the Lord. Amen. And, and I'm not going to repeat what we just heard, but it, we we give to get to give to get to give. Amen. That is the, the, the life cycle of a Christian, and so just don't forget that. Um, with that being said, don't forget our evening activities, and you are dismissed.